a little more about that. So, hello everybody, welcome to episode 6 of Sex Work with the Butterfly Princess Steph Marie and Amy Taylor. Uh, this, in this episode, we're going to be discussing sex work, sex work policy and advocacy. So, uh, first we have our current legal framework. Criminalisation. Yeah. Yeah, so um, so uh, I'll tell I'll pass on to Amy now to talk to you about current legal frameworks. So yeah, for anybody who um wants to get more educated on this, maybe you love somebody as a sex worker, maybe you are one, maybe you're an ally. Thank you for whoever you are and why ever you're listening to this. Maybe you're just curious. That's okay too. Um, but there's a lot of education that you can do and this show and many others. Uh, firstly, if you're not clear or less clear, there's basically three current legal frameworks, three way, main three main ways that municipalities, countries, legal frameworks deal with sex work. Uh, there's criminalization. So um, in many countries, our work is just illegal. Uh, and that subjects us and our clients sometimes and anybody who we live with or work with to arrest, prosecution, um, imprisonment, uh, all that comes along with that, uh, that exacerbates the vulnerability of people in this and the, and the customers who hire them and marginalizes them. Uh, so there's a, and the second way is what's called decriminalization. Sort of you think of that as they, they sort of leave us alone. Uh, some regions like New Zealand, they've adopted that and uh, the work is legal and it's regulated like every other form of labor. And that the, those places are attempting to protect the rights of sex workers and improve their working conditions. Uh, so far, the decrim places are having great results, like really great results. That's why this is the world that we would like, because the data shows that this is what works. And then the third way is legalization. So Germany and the Netherlands have done that as well as some other places. Uh, but there's a there's a very a more formally regulated framework. So it's a bit different from decrim. Um, that can include licensing requirements, health checks, uh, restrictions on where places can be. It creates a sort of bureaucratic nightmare where some people are treated better than others. Usually money and certain races and classes are treated better. And it's so it still perpetuates more stigma. So we don't advocate for this system throughout history. Many societies have tried it. We've talked about the history of sex work, um, but that is the third main way. So. And obviously with um, obvious, you know, you know, these, um, education and reform obviously there's a number of uh you know advocacy groups where people uh, that you know sex workers can go to in order to get support for various different reasons mm. yeah there's many there's pretty much a group everywhere. Uh, they go by different acronyms as nonprofits and advocacy groups do but wherever you are, there's there's some of us fighting for your rights. We're feisty, we're feisty bitches. Uh, so in Europe, there's ICRSE. They um, are working on access to healthcare and working toward decrim and working on discriminatory issues. They're they're advocates for human rights, labor rights, health access. Um, there's NSWP. They uh, work globally and uh, they oppose criminalization and punishment and they support more evidence-based policy rather than emotionally based, i.e. religious or moral panic-based policies, which never work on anything, by the way, folks. Data, you have to come from a place of data and logic. When you come from a place of emotion, with anything, with your money, with your, uh, yeah, emotion, we are very stupid when we're emotional. And that's why we're stupid about sex work because we're coming at it from a place of emotion. So I digress. There are national and local groups in my country and the United States of America. There's SWOP, S-W-O-P, Sex Workers Outreach Project. We got tons of chapters all over the country. They're grassroots. They want to end violence and stigma. We've got a pack the court case, uh, pack the court event coming up in Las Vegas for a sex worker who was murdered. Um, 
We just got Joey the player put in prison. This guy who was terrorizing escorts for for years. Um, and so we work in advocacy, education, and community building. Um, we go, we have sex workers behind bars where you can donate to women who are incarcerated and men, sorry, sex workers who are incarcerated. Um, and we just community build if you're lonely. Uh, we do fun stuff too. We do gift packages for street-based sex workers to help them with basic needs. Uh, we do like 4th of July fireworks and barbecues. Like, so we also do just a lot of social stuff so that you're less lonely and you know that you got folks. Um, and then there's ECP. They, the campaign for uh, decriminalization of our work, uh, they're in the UK doing great things, focusing on edu economic justice, uh, safety and legal rights. So, so there's pretty much somebody just Google wherever you are. There's somebody. What, what about what are the essence of these advocacy groups? Yeah. So like I said, there's campaigns to fight for decriminalization. Um, that, uh, I was talking earlier about New Zealand as a successful example over a decade ago, they, uh, did something called the prostitution reform act. I don't love the name, but whatever, who cares? And, uh, they, but it's been reported the, there've been great outcomes and safety and legal protections. And, uh, and it's a beacon of a country taking a chance on thinking logically instead of emotionally doing what's smart instead of what feels good to your desire to spite and punish those you disagree with. And it has predictably come uh, brought great outcomes. Turns out, shockingly, when you use your brain, instead of your fury, you get better outcomes. Who would have thunk it? Uh, there's also a lot of global campaigns, many advocacy works. Um, they're promoting decriminalization because it uh, enhances health and safety of sex workers who are usually the young and the poor and uh, no society wants those to just die because those are valuable people. I hope I hope you all agree. Um, anyway, so why we're obviously trying to prevent uh, and sort of put in place anti-trafficking measures and stuff like that? Yeah, there are, um, so there are, uh, like we were talking about in a previous episode, it's crucial to distinguish between consensual sex work of consenting adults that the state has no business about and should leave alone and trafficking, which is a problem. Abusive, coercive labor is always a problem in any industry. So current policymaking is conflating them and calling them the same thing, which is stupid and wrong. And um, they, uh, they, we need better policy that protects the rights of consensual sex workers, not criminalizing them, and then also still provides support for trafficking victims, like uh, legal assistance, healthcare, housing, um, that's essential for their recovery and reintegration, re uh, getting them out of a terrible situation. Well, well, thank you, Amy. Uh, it's been really interesting to hear about um, the, you know, social stigmas and reform and everything. Like, like this is an ongoing series. Um, so obviously we've been discussing in this episode education reform advocacy. Join us next time for the next episode. Thanks for talking about it. If we can address what's wrong with our industry, we can make it better. Thank you.